sorted. I uh, saw a few of you having uh, handles over at the back benches, so I'll expect no heckling this afternoon of any of our speakers. When I was uh, at Wellington College, student at Wellington College, we studied um, Tudor and Stuart England, and uh, I can still remember the sniggers at uh, the figure of uh, James I and what a dodgy sort of a character he probably was. And so it was uh, with some fascination that I read uh, Wynne Beasley's uh, posthumous diagnosis uh, of James's condition a few years ago. I read it a few years ago, that is. And, uh, and so I, th I think that you'll be similarly intrigued um, by what uh, Wynne is suggesting um, in, from his research. So th please uh, put your hands together to welcome Wynne Beasley. James VI of Scotland succeeded to the English throne in 1603 and travelled south to his new capital, London. One of his first actions was to convene a conference at Hampton Court Palace in an effort to promote unity of religion. The Church of England was factionalised and the Puritan element found fault with what it saw as popish doctrine and practice. James opened the conference on the 14th of January 1604. He and his Privy Council met first with the Church of England representatives. The next sitting day, a Presbyterian minister joined the meeting, and so did Dr. John Reynolds, recently Dean of, Lin of Lincoln and now President of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, as spokesman for the Puritans. Reynolds soon got offside with the King, however, and for the Puritans it was all downhill from there until Reynolds suggested the translation of the Bible into English for the benefit of the individual worshipper. Now that did appeal to the King, who had indeed proposed something similar for Scotland back in 1601, and six working parties, two each in Westminster, Oxford and Cambridge, were set up and their work was accomplished in seven years, and the result, of course, was the reason we're here today. And I would claim that the King James Version is still arguably the best translation for public reading. In spite of that achievement, King James the Sixth and First has been ridiculed by historians for four centuries. As a sample of this derision, let me share one or two comments with you. David Hume dismissed James in the measured cadences of the 18th century. Awkward in his manner and ungainly in his person, he was ill-qualified to command respect. In the 19th century, Lord Macaulay went even further. He wrote of James as a sorrowful ruler, exhibited to the world stammering, slobbering, shedding unmanly tears, trembling at a drawn sword, and talking in the style alternately of a buffoon and a pedagogue. <laughs> the 20th century produced the passing scorn of J.B. Priestley in 1973, writing of the slobbering, cowardly King James, and the more meticulous venom of Lawrence Stone just one year before, and I quote him, his ungainly presence, mumbling speech, and dirty ways did not inspire respect. Reports of his blatantly homosexual attachments and his alcoholic excesses were diligently spread back to a horrified countryside. It was reported that when hunting, the king did not dismount to relieve himself and so habitually ended the day in a filthy and stinking condition. Well, you have to wonder, how did it get to this? <laughs> and like Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, a whole pile of misinterpretation was erected on a small foundation. And it was coming across this small foundation that got me started on a piece of detective work. Almost 20 years ago, 
I bought A Life of Shakespeare, written by a man called Dennis Kay. And I read casually to the point where Shakespeare's theatre company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, was renamed the King's Men at the accession of James. But there Kay inserted an account of James, written by a courtier named Sir Anthony Weldon. And reading this description, I realised that I was reading a perceptive account by an observant layman of physical features that added up to a provisional diagnosis. Now, Weldon was a courtier, but he was less diplomatic in his opinions than courtiers needed to be. And when he published a book called A Perfect Description of the People and Country of Scotland, where he likened marriage to a Scots woman to being chained to a dead carcass, <laughs> he ceased to be popular at James's court. <laughs> now, this has led to the view that his description of James is actuated by malice, but it hasn't stopped generations of historians from quoting, even misquoting him with glee. Here's his account. Hmm. Thanks. He says, the king's character is much easier to take than his picture, for he could never be brought to sit for the taking of that. <laughs> he was of a middle stature, more corpulent through his clothes than in his body. Yet fat enough, his clothes ever being made large and easy, the doublets quilted for stiletto proof, his breeches in great pleats and full stuffed. He was naturally of a timorous disposition, which was the reason of his quilted doublets. His eyes large, ever rolling after any stranger that came in his presence, inasmuch as for shame many have left the room as being out of countenance. His beard was very thin, <coughs> his tongue too long for his mouth, which ever made him speak full in the mouth, <coughs> and made him drink very uncomely, as if eating his drink, which came out into the cup on each side of his mouth. <coughs> his legs were very weak, having had, as was thought, some foul play in his youth, or rather before he was born, that he was not able to stand at seven years of age. That weakness made him ever leaning on other men's shoulders. His walk was ever circular, his fingers ever in that walk, fiddling about his codpiece. <laughs> <coughs> now, of these features, the point about the thin beard may be cleared away for a start. <coughs> its value is simply this, that it checks Weldon's acuteness and reliability as an observer. The historian dramatist Arthur Wilson, who published The Life of James the year after the King's death, commented that his beard was scattering on his chin and very thin and other observers of the time also noted James's beard, or lack of one, in particular his portraitists. <coughs> Here's the work of a couple of them. Vincent paints him beardless at 19, and Mighton shows a meagre growth in later years. The other features, that's to say the ones that lead us to a diagnosis, fall into three groups or categories, and once again, the Weldon is verifiable in each of them. First, the restlessness and the rolling eyes. James's restlessness is confirmed in a letter sent by his mother's envoy, <coughs> Monsieur de Fontenay, to her secretary in 1584. Here it is. His manners are aggressive and very uncivil, both in speaking eating, clothes, games. Well, so far that could apply to any number of teenagers, but the letter goes on. He never stays still in one place, taking a singular pleasure in walking up and down, but his carriage is ungainly, his steps erratic and vagabond, even in his own chamber. Next, speech and drinking affected. James's physician, the illustrious Sir Theodore Turquet de Meurne, noted this feature 
and in his case notes appears his gullet is narrow causing difficulties in swallowing and he refers also to the leg weakness we've already heard from Fontenoy <coughs> of James's erratic and vagabond steps and my own commented on the fact that James did not walk until the sixth year of his age he also refers to his clumsiness and to the leanness and say to say atrophy of his legs and in a telling phrase James Melville nephew of Andrew the Scottish divine recalled meeting the nine-year-old king I heard him discourse walking up and down in his governess's hand of knowledge and ignorance to my great marvel and astonishment so he was a child learned beyond his years but at nine still in his governess's hand so what was wrong with him in 1861 Another anniversary, 150 years ago. William John Little, a physician at the London Hospital, read a paper to the Obstetrical Society on the influence of abnormal births on the mental and physical conditions of the child, especially in relation to deformities. This, he explained, built on his paper in The Lancet 20 years earlier, in which he'd linked spastic rigidity in the newborn with complications at birth. The condition he described became known as Little's disease, and we know it as cerebral palsy. Little's paper and descriptions of cerebral palsy and some of the orthopedic classics allow us to probe the three features that we've gathered in from Wendelin's account. First, the inability to stay still and its three manifestations. Restlessness. Well, here from the celebrated Jones and Lovett text of 1923, the patient constantly makes purposeless and sometimes harmful movements. And a generation or more later, that gifted teacher, Alan Apley, athetosis, that's the wriggling movements, are more common than was formerly supposed. The limbs wave around with continual worm-like movements. Fiddling about the codpiece, from Little's own paper, he describes the position that the limb of the cerebral palsy tends to adopt. <coughs> with the arms held down. And indeed, as you see in the boy on the right there, quite a suitable position for fiddling about the codpiece. Next, the rolling eyes. Here's Walter Mercer, a former president of the Edinburgh College. Sometimes produced bilateral grimacing of the face. Next, the problems with speech and drinking. Here's Little again. Muscles of speech are commonly involved. The power of carrying survivor into the throat is not acquired until late. And Philip Wiles, beautiful remark, speech may be disturbed deglutition uncertain. That simply means that there's some debate whether it goes down the right way. And finally, peculiar gait and delay in walking. Little wrote, even children slightly affected rarely go alone before three or four years of age. The gait is shuffling, stiff, and wiles again. If the legs are affected by athetosis, it's difficult to place the feet accurately. Now, I've deliberately quoted from our orthopedic ancestors in establishing a match so that I can't be accused of forcing my own interpretation on things. But I think you'll agree that the match is a good one and that James did indeed suffer from cerebral palsy with significant athetoid elements. To confirm the diagnosis, we have the evidence of the royal portraits. Now, I've long been impressed by the importance of the artist as observer and witness. Even though royal portraitists in those days felt obliged to flatter, as a form of life insurance indeed, <laughs> there is still a point where artistic conscience takes over. Here's <coughs> Arnold von Bronckhorst painting James as a child of eight. Now those windswept legs can only be a real condition. 
an Apley's illustration of a slightly older boy with cerebral palsy show the sort of appearance that Bronckhorst must have been trying to depict. The giveaway in the Mitens portrait of James is the Aquinas of the left foot, that's to say the foot pointing downwards instead of to the front. And also, if you look critically, there is Aquinas of the right foot. The deformity is carefully but diplomatically recorded. In the illustration of the athetoid hemiplegic girl, Beckett Howarth's book, her affected right leg shows the hip part bent, the knee part bent, and the foot in the position of Aquinas. Moreover, her right hand is steadied by the unaffected hand, but in a male would otherwise be in a suitable position for fiddling about the codpiece. More than that, Howarth in his caption draws attention to the facial appearance of the girl, which resembles James's, as depicted by Mitens, the eyes set behind the upper lip and the lower lip jutting. The de Critz portrait shows James standing and leaning backwards. And this is what you do if you want to stand with an equinus foot placed pat on the floor. But the point is this, if you're painting the king, you don't pose him in this strange way unless something strange is going on. And that something is the Aquinas foot. Well, my diagnosis was published in the journal named the 17th century, which comes out of the University of Durham. And this came about through a series of happenstances the most significant being the Wellington academic historian, Lucy Halberstam, who I'm delighted is here today, coached me in writing historian speak, which is quite a different dialect from med speak. And she confided during this coaching program that she was impressed by my diagnosis because she had long felt that James resembled a fellow academic of hers, the late Donald Anderson. Now, I'd also known Donald, who was my neighbour in Knox College in 1949, and I too had been strongly reminded of him when I was working on James's story. After Otago, Donald had spent time in Oxford, where he became persuaded by his experience of formal dinners, at which he ended up supporting his so-called normal colleagues, that spastics are never so sober as when they're drunk. Because then alcohol forms a passable substitute for the faulty upper motor neurons in their damaged brains by damping the erratic limb movements that characterize the condition. One of the criticisms beloved by James's detractors has been his heavy drinking. But perhaps he made the same discovery as Donald Anderson. Well, I received cautious endorsement from various historians, <laughs> and only one challenged me on the basis that he couldn't see how my interpretation fitted with James's enthusiasm for riding and hunting. And I was inspired to remind him of the success of riding for the disabled, with cerebral palsy children, and he too became a believer. In 1998, Roger Lockyer's biography of James noted my diagnosis with approval, but didn't take the next step of describing James and his life against the knowledge of the handicap that he had to surmount. Other biographers of James, like the celebrated Simon Sharma, who don't read their journals, continue to parrot the old story. Well, what's now needed is a biography that takes the next step. Now, I'm certainly not the physician, the uh, historian to write it, but I can provide a precy, and here it is. Where do we start? Well, the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh was founded in 1505 and gained its first Royal Charter the following year, so the story might well start with James IV, who was the king concerned. 
who was in a way the first modern king in the Stuart line, who was fascinated by science, who paid his subjects to let him pull their teeth, who encouraged the royal physician Damien to pursue his studies into flight. Damien made a set of wings and wearing these leapt from the battlements of Stirling Castle, so creating a vacancy in the royal household. <laughs> But James IV gave a boost to Scotland at its crown and then threw it all away at Flodden. His young son, James V, found it hard to impose order on a restless society and, uh, dying of a broken heart after losing the Battle of Solway Moss in 1542, just days after learning that his French wife, Mary of Guise, had given birth to a daughter, it's said that he mused on the fortunes of the Stuarts. The Dell gang went. It'll end as it began. It came we alas, and it'll gang we alas. Well, Mary's infant daughter, also Mary, grew up in France, was proclaimed Queen of Scots at the age of 12, with her mother as regent, and was married to the French Dauphin until his early death. And she arrived, an 18-year-old widow, in the realm of Scotland in 1561, to find it in the middle of religious and civil strife. While John Knox railed against her in the High Kirk of St Giles, <coughs> he wrote a prayer for the Edinburgh College of Surgeons. And it asks for divine guidance to act without malice, grudge, or partiality, which is fine, but Knox in full cry was unable to avoid those very same faults. <laughs> While all this went on, Mary married her cousin, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, in 1565. He was rather an odious young man, but nursing invalids is often a bonding exercise and Mary had taken care of him when he had the measles. The following year, not long after a party of Darnley's thugs had murdered her secretary Riccio at her very feet, she bore her son in the tiny room at Edinburgh Castle. I've paced it out at its maximum. It measures 10 feet by 7, that's to say 3 metres by 2.2. It was a long and difficult labour, and the child is said to have been born with a call of membranes wrapped round his head. All in all, the sort of difficult birth that Littlewood described three centuries later. Ironically, such a phenomenon was then supposed to foretell a charmed life. Well, James's was hardly charmed. And Weldon. He seems to have had some insight into the effect of a perilous pregnancy and labour. Some foul play in his youth, or rather before he was born. And as a side thought, should we perhaps be calling it Weldon's disease, not Little's disease? Well, within a year, Darnley was murdered, Mary was deposed, and the child was crowned King of Scots, the Kirk of the Holy Rood in Stirling. He came into the care of his mother's half-brother, James V's bastard son, James Stuart, Earl of Murray, then of Darnley's father, the Earl of Lennox, briefly the Earl of Mar, and then the Earl of Morton. A fine bunch of thugs they were if you look at them. As a child, he was taught by his tutor, George Buchanan, to hate the mother he'd never known, and his precocious scholarship was fostered even as he struggled with his disabled body. Twice he was taken hostage, the first time during his teenage years, by members of the troublesome Reuben family. And at the age of 13, he became for a time infatuated with a French cousin, Esme Stewart. He would thereafter have homosexuality added to his catalogue of claimed weaknesses, though Antonia Fraser's reference to a passionate desire to worship something more physically perfect than the stunted prodigy's body with which he'd been endowed. 
this has more the ring of truth. <coughs> and as the historian Jenny Wormald has pointed out, there was no hint of homosexuality in the 1586 report on him. In 1587, now aged 21, James chose Anne, the younger daughter of the King of Denmark, as his wife in a convoluted negotiation which resulted in a proxy wedding in 1589. When Anne was persuaded, <coughs> when Anne was prevented by storms from coming to Scotland, James himself sailed to Oslo, where she'd taken refuge, and after two more marriage ceremonies brought his bride home. There were seven children of the marriage, three of whom survived to maturity. Henry, Prince of Wales, of whom there were high hopes, but who died of typhoid at the age of 18. Elizabeth, who married the Elector Palatine, suffered the setbacks of continental politics and became an exile known as the Winter Queen, but it's from her that the Hanoverian line has descended, and the unfortunate Charles, who inherited his father's prejudices, but not his canny wisdom. Now Charles, of course, <coughs> was the spare when Henry was the heir, and I think some of Charles's difficulties can be traced to this. But during all this period, James was the pawn, less than hostage, but also less than protege, of Elizabeth of England. Childless herself, she put off acknowledging James as her heir. Prevarication was always one of her political strengths. But at her death in 1603, he succeeded to her throne as descendant through both parents of Henry VII. He'd been through a lot of strife in his youth, but as King of Scots he'd seen a good deal achieved, including the founding of Edinburgh University in 1582. And in spite of his physical disabilities, he was an active King of Britain, in whose, e in whose evolution he played a pivotal part. <coughs> Indeed, the Jamestown settlement, established under his patronage, was Britain's first successful colonising venture in the New World. The union of the two kingdoms threw up all sorts of difficulties, even to the nature of the flag that should emerge from the new situation. Recent historians have acknowledged that although his reign sowed the seeds of future trouble, he left England more stable than he'd found it at his accession. He also achieved that rare feat, the one we celebrate today, of tasking an assembly of divines to produce a new translation of the Bible, and that they achieved within seven years. Antonia Fraser quotes from the dedication of the work and comments, while the word author owes something to flattery, the word mover does not. And as Winston Churchill put it, this may be deemed James's greatest achievement, for the impulse was largely his. But James was himself a published author. To use the modern term, his Basilican Dorum of 1598 dealt with the subject of kingship. It was designed for son Henry, but it seeded in the mind of son Charles some of the delusions that would cost him his throne and his life. And in 1604, a pioneer of the anti-smoking movement, James published, anonymously at first, his counterblast to tobacco. His detractors have painted him a physical coward. They may have been correct, but uh, he had seen a good deal of killing in his youth and didn't aspire to be a physical hero. But he held himself together during kidnap conspiracy and the rescue of his bride. He had moral courage and the wisdom to steer a middle course on many issues, not least as between France and Spain. In pursuit of that policy, he allowed Charles, accompanied by George Villiers, created uh, Duke of Buckingham as the King's latest favourite, 
to go off to Spain on a madcap enterprise in search of the Infanta's hand in marriage. The two young men lacked the subtlety of the Spanish court and brought back not the Infanta but her portrait as their only trophy. <laughs> James's letters to the travellers are instructive. They read more like the words of a father to two sons rather than one son and a lover. I think much of James's admiration for handsome young men was envy-based rather than lusting. He was, even if no warrior, a keen horseman. But that was trying enough that was a trying enough business whatever we think of Stone's version of it. Robert Chambers wrote a biography of James in 1830, one of the more understanding ones of that century, which described how, and I quote him, he was trussed on horseback, and as he was set, so he would ride, without poising in the saddle. When his hat was put on his head, he wouldn't take the pains to alter it, but it sat as it was put on. Riding for the disabled, indeed. And as if to emphasise James's predicament through life, here's Chambers again. His carriage was still undignified on account of the weakness of his limbs, and in walking into a room he was still under the necessity of shambling along the walls for support or leaning on the shoulders of his courtiers. This Van Summer portrait shows him balanced somewhat precariously. Art critics comment on the fact in front of the windows of the banqueting house that he was building in Whitehall. After his death, Charles engaged Peter Paul Rubens to paint the necessary panels for the ceiling. The central oval was an apotheosis of James. But curiously, the figure of James is still leaning on other men's shoulders. Figures representing justice and religion are giving him a hand up. Ironically, Charles would walk across this very room and out one of the windows we saw a moment ago to reach the scaffold in, 18, in 1649. And here I should record my old friend Ian McLaren, when he learned of my interest in James a few years ago, provided me with the details of a conversation between Henri IV of France and his courtier, the Duke of Sully. Sully, sire, the King of England is a fool. Henri, then Sully, he is the wisest fool in Christendom. You see, Sully, unlike his king, had allowed himself to be misled into assuming that James's peculiarities of appearance and behaviour were of his own <coughs> choosing, rather than being the stigmata of his disability. And four centuries of historians have followed his example. Now we make a point of urging understanding of the disabled in our communities today. And I suggest that we owe a comparable understanding to James. For what he did achieve, in spite of his disability, was remarkable for a spastic athetoid, especially in the conditions of his time. And so I hope that I've been able to advance the understanding of a much maligned king, James Stuart, the sixth king of Scots, and the first of a greater Britain, the king who gave us the Bible. Thank you. Probably within living memory of people who remembered him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that's my assumption. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.
converts them, I think. And um, <coughs> hiding under here. So thank you for sharing your uh, your diagnosis with us, and I think you've made a compelling uh, a compelling case for it. So thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Are those speech notes available? Yeah. Um, we have asked the well, speakers. Well, it's to being provide recorded, us. and yes, they are available in the sense that if I um, convert this from 16 point, which I use when reading, to um, 11 point or something, it'll fit onto just a few pages. Thank you. And now Rob's going to read to us from Isaiah, I think. 